What? It's 8 in the morning. I don't drink beer all the time. Today's video is brought to you by the all-new Fractal Design Define 7. Whether you're building a gaming desktop, workstation, or home server, the Define 7 has your needs covered. With an integrated fan hub, flexible cooling layouts for both air and liquid cooled systems, optional vertical GPU mounting, and support for up to 14 hard drives, there's no limit to what you can build. And if you happen to find that limit, there's always the Fracta Design Define 7 XL. Click the links down in the video description to learn more. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. My in-laws recently purchased a new house, and unfortunately, the all-in-one Wi-Fi and router provided by the local cable company just isn't quite cutting it for their 3,000 square feet. So today, I'm going to be building them a home network from scratch, starting with the pile of parts right next to me. Now, I know these network parts are a little bit smaller than what you're used to seeing on my channel, but as I hear, not everyone wants a full server rack in their house. I don't understand it, but I guess noise, power draw, and size are all considerations when thinking about what you want to put in your home network. So with all that into consideration, what am I going to be putting into their home network? Well, for the router and firewall combo, I decided to go with a Unify USG, that is the Unify Security Gateway. And it has two main advantages for this purpose. Number one, it does support full gigabit connectivity and is rock solid for reliability. And number two, I can remotely manage it through my Unify Cloud account so I don't have to drive out there every time there's a problem. Now I know I've talked a little bit about the Unify USG before as I do use one at home and I think I've deployed somewhere close to 20 of these in my career, but I don't think I've ever actually gone over the hardware. Uh, what you get out of the box is the Unify USG itself and a nice little 12 volt power cable that's uh, pretty much the same one used by all of your cable modems. The top of the USG is plastic and has a nice RGB LED ring underneath the Unify logo. It lets you know the status of your firewall at a glance and whether or not it's connected to a controller or actively routing traffic. On the front, there is a console port, which we use for serial connectivity, but don't worry, we won't be diving into that at all during this tutorial. Uh, that is pretty much just for advanced settings on the firewall. There is a WAN 1 connection, which is your connection to your ISP, either through your cable modem, fiber provider, or a DSL connection. We have a LAN 1 port, which goes out to your local network switch. And then we also have an optional LAN 2 or WAN 2. So depending on if you want to do multiple VLANs or set up multiple networks, you can do that all with a single gateway and firewall. Now, while the Unify USG is going to be pretty much the brains of our home network, you actually can't manage this directly. You need to install the Unify controller onto a compatible computer. And a lot of people just use their Windows desktop for this, but I don't want to run the Unify controller on a Windows desktop that my in-laws are going to be using. So instead, we're going to install that onto a Raspberry Pi. That Raspberry Pi is the Raspberry Pi 4 2 GB model. I opted to go with this one because number one, it's only $45, and number two, it has plenty of horsepower available to run both our Unify controller, as well as my DNS-based ad blocking and adult content filter I'll be running for the grandkids' devices when they come over. More on that in the next video. Now again, I'm designing this home network for someone who is not overly techy and doesn't want a lot of devices hanging around everywhere. So I'm going to be hiding the Raspberry Pi by wall mounting it and running it on power over ethernet. That way I won't actually need a second power cable for my Raspberry Pi. It'll be powered directly off the network switch that I bought for them. Now the Raspberry Pi Foundation does have a power over ethernet hat that they sell and it is pretty affordable. The problem is it is a fairly large unit that sits on top of the Pi and it's not very case friendly. Uh, I've decided to go with this little guy right here from UC Tronics, and uh, it works the same way that the official one does, in that it is just plug and play on top of the Pi. So that's the installation right there. We're ready to power this thing over Ethernet. That case I have in mind is this guy right here, and unfortunately there's no actual name on this device, so links for everything will be down in the video description. I bought all this on Amazon if you want to uh, follow my lead. Uh, this is designed to be a Raspberry Pi VESA mount case, that is a case to mount your Raspberry Pi to the back of the monitor. But a screw hole is a screw hole, meaning that I can just bolt this up to the wall and achieve the same goal. All right, I'm already gonna give this thing a negative review. Um, number one, I like the design. I like the nice aluminum enclosure. It is fairly sturdy, um, but uh, it has a screw that's holding this top panel on. And the screwdriver is inside there, inside a plastic bag. Um, so if you don't already have a screwdriver to open the top panel, you can't get to the screwdriver, which you need to open the top panel. It's like buying a pair of scissors and they come in those rigid plastic melted cases. There we go. Hey, look, a screwdriver. 
All right, now that we have our screwdriver, we can continue. Um, pretty nice little kit. It does include a couple of heat sinks. Uh, unfortunately, we won't be able to use most of those because the space is going to be taken up by the power over ethernet controller. But assembly is pretty straightforward. We're just gonna slip the uh, Raspberry Pi down inside the case like that and screw it down. And I haven't even gotten the first screw in and I'm already done with that. You could totally use that screwdriver in a pinch. The problem is number one, it's not magnetic. So getting the screws actually into the holes is a little bit of a pain. Number two, it wasn't actually a perfect fit for the Phillips heads on these screws. So stripping these screws out would be a real possibility um, and something I would like to avoid because eventually I would like to get uh, this Raspberry Pi back out of this case. Now this case does come with a little 20 millimeter fan here with a heat sink attached to it, but it, fortunately it's not gonna quite fit on top of the CPU right there because again, that Pi hat uh, extends just a little bit further. So I'm just gonna put a little black passive heat sink on this and call this good. Again, we're not uh, shooting for overclocking world records here on the Raspberry Pi. We just want it to run stable. When I go to do their final installation, I do have an eight port power over ethernet switch that I will be running everything off of. So the Raspberry Pi, as well as the four access points I'm installing will be powered by that switch. Unfortunately, the USG does not have power over ethernet. And I kind of wish it would because they have an edge router with power over ethernet in that is basically the same internal hardware, just a little bit different management platform. So uh, Unify, I would love a USG with power over ethernet in for cases like this. For the OS, I'm using a Patriot 16 gigabyte micro SD card and running Raspbian Buster Lite, which is essentially the server distro of Raspbian. And there are plenty of tutorials showing you how to actually image a micro SD card, so I'm not gonna go over that today, but just download Balana Etcher from the Raspberry Pi website and follow the instructions in the links. All right, we are finally booted into the Raspberry Pi, and that was way more complicated than it should have been to get an HDMI output into my capture card. But nevertheless, pushing on. Uh, we're going to start by going into the Raspberry Pi configuration menu, which is done by typing sudo raspi-config. First thing I like to do is go into localization options and change this over to US standard, uh, mainly because, well, I live in the US. If you live in a different locale, you're more than welcome to choose your own. But you do want to make sure to do this because if you go to type in a password and your keyboard layout is wrong, well, it's going to type in whatever it decides to use for your keyboard layout rather than the characters you actually want. So in my case, we're going to go ENUS UTF-8. Then we're going to go back to localization options and change the keyboard layout. Uh, we're going to select a generic 105 key PC keyboard, go to other. We're going to select English US and select English US default. All right, now we can start going through the actual configuration of the Pi. Uh, for starters, I'm going to change the password from something other than Raspberry to, well, not Raspberry. Next, we're going to go down to network options, and I'm going to change the host name of the Raspberry Pi. Uh, so we actually know what this is on the network when we're doing a network scan or seeing client devices. And in this case, we're just going to type in rpi-server, since this is going to be the only server that's running on their network. Next, we're going to go down to interfacing options, and we're going to enable SSH. This will allow me to remotely manage the Raspberry Pi without physically hooking up an HDMI monitor or keyboard to it and you'll log in with the credentials you just set up. That is Pi for the username and whatever the password you entered other than Raspberry. Hopefully you entered a password other than Raspberry. Did you change the default password? Because you should have. That's pretty much all you need to do if you're going to be accessing the Pi over SSH. However, some people like to disable overscan uh, so you don't get the black border that we see on the HDMI output right now. You can also select a custom resolution. I'm gonna leave this as the default because well, you guys need to be able to view this. Other than that, let's go ahead and hit finish and we'll reboot. Now that we're rebooted, let's go ahead and log in and you can test that uh, default password that you just set up. Now we're gonna run sudo apt update. This will go out to the Raspbian package manager and find any new versions of software that need to be installed. Next, we're gonna type sudo apt upgrade and this will actually download and install those new versions of the software. And hopefully this doesn't take too long. And finally, before we close out this console and SSH into the Raspberry Pi and start the installation process for Unify, we're gonna go ahead and set up a static IP address. This way the Unify controller always stays at the same IP address and I know where to SSH into. To do that, we're gonna type in sudo nano forward slash etc forward slash dhcpcd.conf. And don't worry, all of this is down in the video description. So the nice thing about the DHCP CD file is it actually does include all of the examples that you need to get started. Uh, we're just gonna modify this example and call it an actual static IP configuration. 
Uh, so first off, we're going to uncomment all of these lines right here, which is just deleting the little hashtag right before them. And on second thought, we're going to leave the IPv6 address commented out because, well, who uses that on a home network? You guys are weird. So the static IP address is what we're actually going to assign to our Raspberry Pi, and I'm going to give it a static address of 192.168.1.5. The slash 24 on the end of that is called your subnet mask, and you'll need to know what that number is, or you'll need to know how you're going to set up your Unify USG to broadcast DHCP. Or you can just follow my guidelines in here because this is a pretty generic setup for a home network. Down here under static routers, we're going to do a 1.1, and that will actually be the IP address of our Unify USG when we're all done. I'm also going to set the domain name server as 1.1, and I'm going to delete the Google entry right here, as well as the IPv6 entry. That way my Raspberry Pi will only look at our Unify USG for its DNS addressing. Then we're going to type in Control X to exit. We're going to say yes, we would like to save changes, and then hit Enter to save it as the same name. All right, to apply those changes, I'm going to go ahead and reboot. Now you could just apply those changes, but this is just as fast. Now that our static IP address is configured, we're going to SSH into the Raspberry Pi, that is remotely access it over a terminal. Now the advantage to this over connecting just an HDMI monitor and a keyboard is I can actually cut and paste from a desktop session. It makes entering all those commands a lot easier. For this I'm going to use PuTTY and I don't care what client you use and you shouldn't care what client I use. The end result is I'm SSHing into the Raspberry Pi. So I'm going to connect to 192.168.1.5 which is the static address I set up earlier. We're going to connect as Pi and we're going to enter the password that I know you changed earlier because you listened to directions. Now normally I like to write my own tutorials for how to install different services, but there are so many available out there for how to install a Unify controller either on Linux or specifically on a Raspberry Pi. We're just going to follow one of those because why reinvent the wheel? So in this case I'm following the guide from PyMyLifeUp.com. They've got a great write-up on all the hardware you need to actually get this done. We've already done the step one, which is the sudo apt update and sudo apt upgrade to download all of the new software installation packages. So we're going to start on step two, which is installing Java. And here's why we SSH'd in, is because I can select that, I can copy it, I can go over to the terminal window, right click, and it automatically pastes it in. And this is another reason I really like using a Raspberry Pi or Linux-based system to install a Unify controller, is because I don't have to install Java on my main Windows PC. Once that's done, we're also going to install RNG Tools. Once that's finished, we're going to modify just one line in the default RNG setup, which is uncommenting this HWRNG line right there. Basically, that gives a much larger random number generation pool that Unify requires and helps the whole system run a little bit faster. And just like our DHCP configuration, we're going to hit Control X, we're going to hit Yes to save, and then enter for the same name. Now, there are a couple of different methods you can choose from to install the Unify controller. The method that I recommend is setting up the Unify distribution list in your package library. That would allow you to install the Unify controller by simply typing sudo apt install Unify, and it would also keep your Unify controller up to date with the rest of the software in your system. The other option is downloading a specific version of the Unify controller directly from the Unify website. The downside to that is it does not auto-update with the rest of the software in your system. The upside is if you need to run an individual version of the Unify controller, you can choose exactly which one you want. For this tutorial, I'm going to be showing you how to auto-update your package. However, when I actually deploy the system to my in-laws house, I'll be running a particular version of the Unify server as we're running some older non-supported access points and there is a max version for the server software that I can run. So to add the software distribution list, there's pretty much two commands to run. The first of which is adding the Unify list to our software repository. And then next is adding the repo list. And it's done just like that. Next we're going to type in sudo apt update and that will read the new distribution list and I can see dl.ubnt right there, meaning that we are reading from the unified distribution list now. Once that's done, all you have to do is type sudo apt install unify. And this will download the most recent version of the unify server. Once that is done installing, we're going to open up a new browser window and we're going to go to https colon slash slash the IP address of our Raspberry Pi. So again, in my case, 192.168.1.5 colon 8443. So that will connect at port 8443. And you will see a security risk right here. Just go to advanced and say accept risk and continue. The next part is pretty darn simple. It's just walking through the steps of actually setting up your Unify controller. So first we're going to name our network. So I'm just going to name this home network for now, and we're going to accept the end user license agreement. 
Step two is if you have a Unify Cloud account and you would like to access your server remotely, and in my case, I would like to do that, this is where you log in using your Unify credentials. It will add the server that you're setting up right now to your Unify Cloud account and allow you to manage it remotely. Next up, I would leave both of these options checked. That has automatically optimized my network, so apply different fixes for Wi-Fi transmission that most people ordinarily miss, as well as enable auto backup, which does uh, configuration backups for your Unify controller. Step four is to add any Unify devices detected on the network to our Unify controller. And in this case, you can see my Unify USG is a white LED and is ready to be set up by the Unify controller. So we'll go ahead and check that box and click next. Step five is setting up our Wi-Fi SSID and password. For the Wi-Fi name, that will be the broadcast name of your Wi-Fi. I'm just gonna type in home, because again, you guys don't need to know what my in-laws Wi-Fi password is. And for password, I'm just gonna do a very simple password. And then we're also gonna combine the 2.4 and the five gigahertz networks on the same SSID. That will be, we only see one SSID being broadcast, but your client can auto-select whether it connects at 2.4 or five gigahertz. And finally, step six is just confirming the settings that you already entered. If you're good with that, go ahead and hit finish and it will configure your USG and Unify controller. Last thing we're gonna do in this tutorial is configure our DHCP range. That is the IP addresses that are gonna be used by any devices inside of our network. To do that, I'm gonna go down to the bottom left and click on settings under the Unify controller and then click on the networks tab. Right here, you will have two networks that show up. One is the LAN, which is your local area network, that's you, and your WAN, which is your wide area network, that's your internet service provider. So under our LAN, I'm gonna go ahead and click edit. Right here, you can change the name of your LAN, although I'm gonna leave it because, well, LAN makes sense to me. Right here under the gateway and subnet, if you would like to be on something other than 192.168.1.0, this is where you would modify that setting. And right here, you can see that slash 24, that's the subnet I was talking about earlier. The last thing we're gonna do is modify the DHCP range. That is the range of IP addresses that your clients can use if they connect to your Wi-Fi or plug into your home network. The default range is 192.168.1.6 through 254. Now this is a personal preference, but I usually like to have a little bit of a range that I can play with that is not a dynamically assigned IP, that is not automatically assigned by my router to every single device. Uh, I usually start my ranges at about 20, and I will end my ranges at about 249. What that means is that if a client connects via Wi-Fi or plugs into my home network, they will get an IP address between 20 and 249. However, that also allows me to dynamically assign addresses above and below that. So let's say my Wi-Fi access points, I want those to be on DHCP, but I want to give those the addresses of .1.11 through 14. This allows me to set those in a range that is outside of the normal range of my IP devices. Now that that's done, we're gonna go ahead and hit save. And with that, your home network is pretty much ready to go. Now there's obviously a couple things that I'm missing here, like Wi-Fi, but don't worry, I will be ceiling mounting some access points and teaching you how to actually run cable through your attic space. So stay tuned to that if you want to know the proper way to do that. Part two in this tutorial series will be up next, and that is installing a DNS-based ad blocker and adult content filter on your network and allow you to customize what gets blocked and which devices pass through the filter. So definitely make sure you subscribe to the channel so you don't miss that one. Also make sure to follow me on Twitter at Craft Computing, and if you're interested in financially backing the channel, make sure to look me up on Patreon. Link is down in the video description below. It'll get you exclusive access to my Discord server where you can chat with myself and the other hosts from Talking Heads or ask questions about projects like this. Thank you guys so much for watching this video, and as always, I will see you in the next one. Cheers, guys.